This is video two in our series on sensation. In this video, we're going to focus in on specific sensory systems. We'll spend most of our time on the visual system and the auditory system. We'll touch on some of the other systems, but we'll, we'll leave class for most of those discussions. This video is meant to be an introduction, a jumping off point for classroom discussion. So we'll start with vision. The visual system in human beings is our dominant sensory system. Meaning, if we have a discrepancy between, for example, what we hear and what we see, our brain will usually go with what we see. 70% of all of our sensory receptors as uh, human beings are found in the eye. So we can see that it's a, our dominant system. Let's take a quick look at the anatomy of the eye. These are the, the structures that we we'll, won't we'll be able to uh, identify and label. Uh, let's scroll down. Let's look at this picture of the eye here and see the parts that we're going to need to label um, with the cornea which is the outer covering and the lens that we see here and the lens is going to focus the image onto the back of the eye speaking of the back of the eye uh, this layer of cells here this yellow layer is the retina and it's in the retina that we have our receptor cells our rods and cones that are going to actually be stimulated by the energy from light and transduce that energy into neural impulses so if we're looking at this and we have maybe an image out here, maybe we're looking at a tree, uh, that's my nice drawing of a tree, and the, the light from this tree comes into the eye and the, the light comes in and the, the lens is going to uh, focus this image so that it falls to the back of the eye and we see it's going to be flipped upside down if you know from physics how lenses work. Yet, in our brain, our perception of this is uh, that it's right side up, so again, we process that information and our brain turns it around for us. But this focal point uh, sometimes can be shifted, meaning if the shape, if the eye is shaped too oblong or it's maybe it's too narrow, then it's possible for the focus of this image to be maybe too short and in front of the retina, which we'd call nearsighted, or maybe slightly behind, which we'd call farsighted. And of course, we wear corrective lenses to bring that image either forward or push it back so it falls right here on the retina so we can see things uh, and they're not blurry. A couple other things we want to point out here. Um, the fovea centralis, uh, or the fovea, is the center of our visual field. And looking up at this diagram may be a little cleaner. Uh, the fovea. And it's here that we have our highest concentration of cones and we have the sharpest image. But I also want to point out this area where the optic nerve leaves the back of the eye. It's also our blind spot because for at this part right here, we have no receptor cells. All we have here are all the axons from all the other cells that are leaving the back of the eye. So in this spot right here, we have no vision. We actually have an empty spot, yet we don't see it in our visual field because we kind of fill in the blanks. And of course, we would want to be able to identify the retina again, this back portion of the eye. And let's zoom in on the retina and look at the cells that make up the retina. So this is zooming in, and we see uh, we have two very important types of cells. We have our rods and our cones. We have our rods and we have our cones. And rods are better for uh, lightness versus darkness and it's what's responsible for having good or bad night vision. Uh, animals that are nocturnal see well at night have lots higher concentration of rods. And cones are for color. Uh, and in the central of our visual field in the fovea centralis we have a large concentration of cones for very sharp images. So light would come in and strike one of these cells and stimulate it to fire an action potential and it fires an action potential which moves up through these interneurons and the message then transfers down the optic nerve and that's where we have to go back into the brain. Now each of our eyes has a right and a left visual field. Our right eye has a right visual field and a left visual field and our left eye has a right visual field and a left visual field and this diagram the right visual field is in blue. So let's follow the right visual field. The right visual field of the right eye sends its information to the left occipital lobe for, for visual processing. And the right visual field of the left eye in blue here fall, sends its information to the uh, left hemisphere of the occipital lobe. And right here there's a little crossover if it needs to switch uh, over sides. And uh, the thalamus uh, roots those sensory neurons to the uh, the visual system to the back of the brain for the occipital lobe for visual processing. 
Once these elements of our visual system uh, get to this visual processing center, uh, different parts of it are kind of parceled out for processing. And we have very specific receptor cells in the brain that are sensitive to certain features, like horizontal lines versus vertical lines. Uh, we have features that are sensitive to movement, others to depth, and others to color. So if we think about our visual experience being multi-dimensional like this, it's not that we see the whole image. We see components of the image. And uh, each image has form, ground versus uh, background versus uh, foreground, and the, the, the horizontal and vertical lines has motion to it, color, and depth. And we process each of these elements of the visual experience in parallel, separate from each other. It's not that we process form, and then motion, and then color, and depth. We process depth color, motion, form, and we do it in a parallel series, uh, in parallel rather than series, and then we combine those to create the image. What's interesting about that is if one of these systems fails, we get a very unique visual uh, understanding. If you couldn't see color, obviously you'd have your image without color, but what if you couldn't detect motion? You could get form, color, and depth, but not motion, then you wouldn't be able to see things as they're moving. And there are examples of that happening. In class, we'll come up, we'll talk about some more examples of how this system can kind of go awry, and also the fact that there are certain parts of our brain that seem to be dedicated for recognizing certain types of features, such as faces. Now, I don't want to spend too much time in this video, but we will talk about more in class. There are two different theories on color vision in humans. One's called the, cri the trichromatic theory. Uh, which supposes that we have three distinct receptors in the retina for green, blue, and red. And that's the combination of the firing of these receptors that we can perceive all the different colors that we see in our visual experience. But that doesn't explain all of color vision. There's another theory, the opponent process theory, which um, brings to light the, a couple of other phenomena in our color vision system. And it's the idea that we have two opposing color pairs, or three opposing color pairs, yellow and blue, red and green, and black and white, and that we have a hard time seeing both of those colors at the same time. The idea would be that as, the, as we excite the red uh, receptors, that we actually suppress the green, and when we, we're sensing blue, that we can't sense yellow. And there's a little experiment that we're going to do in class uh, with after images where we can see how that might manifest itself. Like I said, this will be a discussion uh, we'll have in class. I just wanted to introduce the terms here so you had the terms as we move forward. So let's move over to hearing and the, uh, the ear. First, let's just go over the anatomy of the, of the ear. We have the outer ear, which helps uh, direct the sound waves that are traveling through the air down the ear canal. And when we reach the end of the ear canal, we have the eardrum, or the tympanum. And this is a thin membrane that stretches across this opening. And as a mem uh, that, that will vibrate with the uh, vibrations of the air that are sound, causing these three m bones of the middle ear, the incus, uh, the malus, the incus, and the stapes, to vibrate and transfer these sound waves into a very mechanical uh, movement of these small bones in the inner ear, which then press on the oval window of this snail-like structure called the cochlea. And it's inside the cochlea that we have the actual receptor cells for sound in a structure called the organ of corti. And up here at the top, this purple structure, this is another inner ear structure. Uh, it's very important for our sensation of uh, balance. This is the, our, our, or our vestibular system. These are called the semicircular canals. And we have on three different axes, the x, the y, and the z axes, this arch. And there's fluid in here. And as that fluid moves around, there are receptor cells in there that give us information about the orientation of our head, up, down, left, right, back, and forth. And uh, it plays an important sen in our sense of balance. We have a couple of nerves that lead out the ear. We have the, the auditory nerve, or the otic nerve, right here, that leads into the temporal lobe of the brain for interpretation of the sound. And we have the vestibular nerve uh, from the semicircular canals that send our, the information to the brain, again, regulating our, our sensing our directional balance, uh, kind of which way we're facing and what's going up or down. Let's think about how this works. When the vibrations from the air, the sound waves, come into the ear canal, and they hit the tympanic membrane, they cause it to vibrate back and forth, which causes these bones to move back and forth, which causes this bone to move back and forth, which inside of the cochlea sends this vibrations that we're coming through this very thin medium, the air, into a thicker medium of fluid. 
and these vibrations in their very specific pattern of frequency and, and, and strength uh, travel through the cochlea uh, and we need to zoom into the cochlea to see what's going on in there. So inside the cochlea, and this is simplified, we have a, a basal membrane that has many hairs on it. So imagine you have all these different hairs and as that fluid passes by it def causes these hairs to deflect and in the organ of corti and the def these hairs are attached to sensory neurons that when they deflect cause the neurons to fire and it's the firing these neurons in the organ of corti these hair cells that um, initiate the nerve impulses uh, in the ear the question becomes how does the ear um, kind of discern pitch and frequency and, and volume and there's two theories uh, that go with this about how the ear actually is working. There's the place theory which says that we interpret pitch based upon where the vibrations occur along that membrane so in other words if they occur out here versus deeper into the structure that the place on the cochlea that's where the hairs are deflecting represents the different pitches uh, the frequency theory says we interpret the sound by the frequency of the auditory nerve firing so two different theories and I think both of them have some some elements that, that work together to explain how the ear works for further information on how the ear works, I have a couple of videos linked on our web page that goes into more details. But for now, if you know the basic uh, physical elements, if you can basically uh, identify the anatomy and where the different things are happening, that's probably enough for now for our psychology course. Now, there are other senses, and again, we're going to spend time ta in class talking about these, uh, some more than others, but obviously our sense of smell and taste, and we're going to relate those two chemical senses to how they affect things like or how they're related to, to memory. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about vestibular, our sense of balance, but our sense of kinesthetics or movement, and how our body's moving, and the concept of proprioception. There's a very interesting uh, idea here. The proprioception is a sense of knowing where our body parts are in relation to, to our other body parts, which is a sense that we don't think about, um, but it's also very important to kind of how we relate to the world. And we can, we're going to read an excerpt from the man who mistook his wife for a hat, where uh, the case study is of a woman who has lost this sense of proprioception. And then, of course, our skin senses, uh, touch and pain, are the two we're going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about. We definitely need to learn about the gate control theory of pain and how we can go about uh, maybe blocking pain sensation or even sometimes ignoring it. Um, and uh, we'll have some interesting things to talk about there. So. With that said, uh, this is our preview video, ends our preview video on sensation, and we'll have another set of videos for perception.